Hey, this is the last coffee house. Originally, I was going to read a Clifford the Big Red Dog book, but instead, we're reading The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. I love and hate this stupid book. Uh, it has some of the best ideas, some of the least humility, and some of the worst defining of terms we've seen so far. So, as always, we will go over the content, I'm going to do some analysis, we'll talk some big picture stuff, and that's how we'll get through the book. So content forward talks about the world is terrifying as a kind of a base concept that needs to be established. The basic motivation of people is to control anxiety about death. And then there's this introduction of this idea of how we want to be heroes. And it's the heroics that are used to, to fight this anxiety about death. And of course, as we'll get into it, uh, this is obviously a very, very broad theory. And generally, when theories are so broad, they explain literally everything that they actually uh, have no meaning. In this case, I think there's actually a, a lot of important concept that's coming out of this. So in the preface, uh, we've got the denial of death is the motivation. That's what motivates people. Fear of death is universal. Of course, that's not literally universal. Some people do not have a fear of death, and they're much more likely to die. <laughs> but, uh, but it's psychologically, it's, it's as universal as it gets. So initially, as human beings, we thought that the truth was slim and elusive. But currently, <laughs> we're in a state where we have this useless overproduction of knowledge. There's a warning here about how people get carried away with the over-exaggeration of their own theories because they have a vested interest in them. And then we get kind of a map of the way the book's going to go. It's going to sum up psychology beginning with Kierkegaard and going through really auto rank and the ideas that they have. And it is a hell of a trip, let me tell you. Chapter 1 is about human nature and the heroic. It looks at the development of psychoanalysis in terms of the urge to heroism. And now, you know, in, in today, religion is no longer a valid heroic system for many more people than has been the case historically. And heroics is based on organismic narcissism. So this is the setup, and this is what we're looking at, is that we've got this urge to heroism, and that is based on this organismic narcissism. Then we go into the terror of death. And there's a discussion about evolution and how this terror of death is not just biological and it's not just about the biology of actual physical death, but you have this symbol of death that you deal with psychologically through your life. And the way that you get power as an individual is from suppression of the fear of death. Then we get the recasting of some basic psychoanalytic ideas. So things like anal fixation, he talks about Freud, he talks about the edible fantasy and how Freud was way too focused on sex as a motivating factor, and actually it was the horror of the basic animal condition that is the primary motivator. And this idea here, this is fascinating. The child wants to become the father himself, or in effect, his own creator. You want to be, and how you develop and what you're trying to accomplish, is to make yourself your own creator, so you don't need a creator. <laughs> And then the mother on the other side is the caregiver for the child, which will come into play later when we discuss it a little bit more. But there's this, this narcissistic project of self-creation is doomed to failure. It's not something that will actually alleviate that fear of death. And there's this distinction here about a self that a, there's both a self and a body and that human beings are confused about which he really is. So that's one of the primary conflicts that we have to deal with psychologically is that we have a self and we have a body and we constantly confuse which the real you is. Human character as a vital lie, a vital lie. There's a fear of one's own greatness and a fear of knowledge of oneself. Now, I mean, these things, it would be pretty hard to argue against their uh, significance when it comes to human beings. But it's this fear of finding out something that can make us look weak or bad in general. And the armor of character is the last defense against death. So you have to maintain that armor of character. And we have uh, this paraphrase of Freud at this point about how psychoanalysis cured the neurotic misery in order to introduce the common misery. <laughs> So that's, you know, at the bottom, we don't reach utopia, which is another thing that will come up later. But at the bottom, we reach common misery as opposed to the neurotic misery. And that's how you get through. That's what you get when you go through psychoanalysis. Then we go into Kierkegaard and Kierkegaard as psychoanalyst. And there's this discussion about how psychiatric processes and religious perspectives are related. You know, they're intertwined very close to each other. Even inextricable, I think, is the word that's used in the book. And the author talks about how Kierkegaard anticipated the data of modern evidence when it comes to psychiatry and psychoanalysis. And then we've get, got this introduction to this idea of how a person must transcend himself. And that's why Kierkegaard ends up on religion. 
people have this urge to freedom and but they feel more comfortable in the prison of one's character and there's this vital lie of character that people deal with and that's how they come to terms with the fear of death and then we get some uh, uh, lovely <laughs> terms about how uh, people need to shed their social conditioning and that they can be on the brink of infinity and and a bunch of other just incredibly broad big terms like that we go into Freud's character. There's so, so many fascinating things in this. So Freud, generally, he omitted, he omitted the idea of the fear of death being the primary motivator. It was all about sex for Freud. But the author goes through these indicators about how Freud was subject to his own denial of the fear of death. And this is in various ways. So it was things like Freud requested that Jung, you know, his primary pupil, his, his big-time student, he wanted help from Jung. And there's this interplay as you go along where you have their, this competitive thing, but also this uh, father-son thing and this all sorts of other things going on around this idea. So Freud would have, there were these curious ways that he seemed to indicate that he was concerned about the fear of death, even though he talked about sex all the time. So things like he would tell people that you may never see me again before he would leave them. He actually set a date for his death, a date that would eventually pass. And then he would, he would grow, have this anxiety about the fact that he did not die on that particular date. He toyed with the spiritualism and he fainted twice. And the circumstances of the fainting are what are significant for the author. So during one situation, he considered Jung his heir, but there was a situation where apparently Jung rejected something that Freud had said, some position that he had, or something like that, and he fainted around this, somewhere around this time. And there was another time where there was this invite where Jung was invited for his own work rather than working on what Freud wanted him to work on, or working with Freud. And during this, he apparently had fainted as well. But another attendee talked about how Freud had these two victories over Jung and, and the fainting spells were coinciding with his two victories over Jung. But either way, it, it's supposed to be related to this kind of a, a situation between Jung and Freud. And there was apparently, when Freud was very young, not young, 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 not young, oh my gosh. Uh, so, when he was a kid, he was, he had a brother and he had wished his brother would die, you know, out of jealousy or whatever. And his brother eventually did. So this, as a psychological guilt the author suggests had a very significant impact and might have impacted his his theories related to whether it was a fear of death or or something having to do with sex but still it's really interesting tidbit to take out and this we're talking about freud's character then we get into Otto Rank and the closure of Kierkegaard as psychoanalyst. And there's this, this idea about how people try to be gods in their relationships. They try to take complete control and eventually it does not cure their fear of death so they lose interest in that relationship. And they have to realize that the cosmic heroism that they're searching for, it has to transcend all those relationships. So you need a beyond, but you start with things that are more local, that are closer. So it would be things like parents. You're trying to satisfy you know, the parental relationship related stuff or your relationship with your significant other and those are things that you try to conquer as a god but when those aren't satisfying and it doesn't cure that fear of death then you lose interest in those and still feel that <laughs> that anxiety about the fear of death works of art try to justify heroism objectively so when somebody's trying to express themselves artistically they're trying to be the hero and they're trying to create that buttress against the death that's coming that they're trying to avoid now, Rank thought that the furthest out and the closest you can get is, is religion. That's what you had to look for. And the author specifically says that if you think Rank isn't hard-headed or empirical enough, it's because you haven't come to grips with his whole work. And that's a, one of those lovely no true Scotsman fallacies. <laughs> but I haven't read all of Rank. I'm sure it'll come up at some point in the Jordan Peterson reading list. But to have that kind of a position, it, it's curious. And I'm guessing that by virtue of the way that this book is written, that there isn't a whole lot of empirical analysis and study and hard-headed scientific work. It's a lot of theorizing and kind of more general stuff. But we'll see. Uh, so chapter 9 talks about the present outcome of psychoanalysis. And again, so much good stuff here. <laughs> and that's why I hate and love this book. Neurosis is people having trouble with existence, but it's not neurosis in the way that we think about it. The individual has to protect himself against the world. That's the fundamental idea here. You have to protect yourself against the world because it's scary and, uh, and death is out there looming. So neurosis makes the world smaller, it makes it bite-sized, or what the author calls partializing. 
you partialize the world so that you can you can eat it and take it in. When the lies that a neurotic tells themselves cause problems, we we call it a psychological issue and say that they need to you know see a psychoanalyst or whatever. But when it doesn't cause problems, all the lies that <laughs> a neurotic tells themselves, then we just call it normal. It's what everybody does. But the big question is, is what level of illusion does one live on? That's what you have to ask, and that's what psychoanalysts have to ask to try to figure out where the healthy area is. And the author talks about how there's this childlike foolishness that is the calling of mature men. You have to have this childlike foolishness. You have a need for legitimate foolishness. But again, the question is, what level of illusion? It's not whether you should lie to yourself, but what level of illusion should you live on? Then we have a general view of mental illness where the author goes into schizophrenia and perversions and somehow says that a guy with a, a shoe fetish, like a women's shoe fetish, sees the shoe as a woman's phallus. And I, I didn't quite get that one, but there are a lot of weird things when it comes to the fetishes. But somehow the fetish gives the courage to a man to be a man. And there's this horror of female genitals. <laughs> <laughs> where people are confused about the nature of a man and they come to this realization that the mother is not an angel but human and carnal and this forces a person to realize that the body is going to decay. So that's why the fear of female genitals. Now, I'm not so terrified of those things at this point so I'm not sure if I overcame that, <laughs> that concern over the decay of the body but, you know, here we are. Chapter 11, Psychology and Religion, What is the Heroic Individual? Some theorists said that most people are trash, and I'm not sure what the context of that was, but it just uh, it makes sense to me, so I wanted to put that in there. This idea of the utopia, utopia of longevity is not going to cure the fear of death, and the example that's put forth is that, okay, so we, we get this longevity... The death fear is going to be much more pronounced because instead of dying and losing, you know, 10 years or 20 years or something like that, you might lose 900 years if you die at a certain point. There is this uh, weird situation where this woman comes in with stomach trouble. This is uh, recounted by the author. This woman comes up in with stomach trouble to psychoanalysis. And she's doing well, you know, in her job and all that. She's single, no kids or anything. And she's talking about how she wants to clear up the stomach trouble. <laughs> and he says that it was the price you pay for not getting married. That it's a psychological ailment and you have to live with your stomach trouble because you never got married. So I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure what all that was about. Psychology is the myth of utopia through self-knowledge. Important idea. Self-knowledge is not really the goal, and it's not going to be a cure for death. Psychology actually becomes a new belief system. And this is something that I must have alluded to at some point that I thought was the case, but it puts so much better in these terms here. Because instead of psychology just being some kind of an empirical dive to try to figure out what's true, it just becomes a new belief system. And it's described by the author as a kind of religious right now. It's just a, it's a new kind of religion that's being used to create a new mythology for you to live by. So psychology needs to be a lived experience, and we need the boldest and most creative myths that we can live by. So therapeutic religions will never replace religion entirely, but these are the structures of the healthy repressions that people need when it comes to psychoanalysis, and just humans in general, all the humans. So that's pretty much the end of the book, and I love it and I hate it. I absolutely love some of these ideas, I mean, just to no end. This whole idea just it makes so much sense to me. And okay, so just to start out, again, amazing ideas. Often often the frame is that we know all the answers, and they are just measuring, the author is just measuring theorists by the standard of we already know everything, which is concerning, obviously. And the big ideas that I have about this are, okay, what does it actually mean? Death as a meme. The idea of death, the fear of death. death as a meme, what does that actually mean? <laughs> How does it get transferred? If if any other kind of idea can be, you know, chopped up and changed, modified, mutated amongst people and have different, you know, allele frequencies uh, when it comes to a population, what does that mean for the idea of death? And is there a different, differing degree of a fear of death by individual? Because if it's not 100%, you know, like the speed of light, if it's not 100% the same amongst all people, then what does that actually mean psychologically? Some people are more afraid of death for versus others, and some people are more motivated by it than others. But in general, I'm pretty right about the framing of most of this. So the heroism in the face of the fear of death, and the, needy, the need for bold and creative myths to provide character as some kind of a shield, it seems so very right to me when it comes to psychology, just based on everything that I've read about the human brain and how it works. Now, obviously, some myths are going to be better than others, but the, the clearest motivating factor to me is that I internally, not only can I not hold all the information out there in the universe to make a final ass 
assessment at one time about what's going on here. But I can't even be sure that my brain is a proper mediator, you know, between reality and the substance of my perception of reality. So that as a motivator is something that seems to allay, you know, any kind of a fear of death because I can't know all the things at one time. But just importantly, like I said, I, these ideas just seem like the right framing of where we might need to start to try to understand a comprehensive structure of human psychology. So big picture wise, all these claims need to be empirically vetted, you know, in the right way. And it's very hard to empirically vet these kinds of claims. A lot of things that theorists do is they will take somebody like Kierkegaard and they can just plug in whatever they want you know, when it comes to the semantics of the arguments and, and say, look how right he was back in the day. And these are way too broad of ideas uh, to really be able to nail down and test these things. Like uh, Paul Bloom has said, and I'm sure I've said this before, uh, psychology is pre-Copernican. We haven't had that moment yet where we really understand how we need to measure human psychology and the best way to test it and theorize about it and all those sorts of things or talk about it. That's probably the most important. It's trying to figure out how to put psychological analysis analyses in the proper terms. And I'm sure many psychologists might <laughs> beg to differ with my criticisms uh, not being in the, in the discipline, but that's my perception of where psychology is at this point. But I think ultimately we are going to need some kind of memetics that will really take into consideration symbology and archetypes that, you know, reappear when it comes to human beings and what they can mean and what they mean to different people, how they change and are mutated when they're transmitted through, you know, film or other works of art or just discussion or whatever. It's not a moral inquiry. It's it's a scientific one. So it's really tough to separate those things in today's uh, United States and, and science in general. Anyway, oh my god, so I love that freaking thing. Uh, it was so much fun to read. I'm going to read it over and over again. If, I don't think I've reread a book since I started doing this, honestly, but uh, we might have to institute some kind of a rereading at like the beginning of the year or something like that so we can go back over the ideas and just have a an open discussion about the ideas as opposed to trying to race through a book like this. So we'll see if we can do that. But anyway, this is The Last Coffee House. Really appreciate it. Uh, you could, There are links in the description if you want to do any of that, but otherwise, you know, I hope all is well, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.